Hey, I want to ask you a question real quick. How many of you can, um, I guess you can agree with me or you, can, you would agree, you say, I've been there too. There's a meme I've been seeing on Facebook and social media and it says, I know that I've gotten older because when I'm driving around, I will turn the volume down so I can see better on the radio. Anybody? Okay, thank you, all of you honest people. Those of you that didn't raise your hand, we'll pray later, it's okay. I, I mean, I don't want to admit it, but I have to. I've done the same thing. I think even like yesterday we were driving, I was like, what am I going, oh. Man, come on. Like, I remember Dad doing that when I was little. Like, Dad, why are you turning it down so I can see better? And I was like, all right. So now, now I'm there, so I understand. It makes a little, a little more sense, but um, not really. So just to be honest, right? This morning, we're continuing our series, Awaken. I want to I wanna read the three key scriptures you've heard quite often, but they, they apply very, very much to today's message as well. Isaiah 43, 19 says, For I'm about to do something new. See, I have already begun. Do you not see it? I will make a pathway through the wilderness. I will create rivers in the dry wasteland. Romans 13, 11. That was Isaiah 43, 19. Did I say that? Okay. Romans 13, 11 says, This is all the more urgent for you. Know how late it is. Time is running out. Wake up. For our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. Lamentations 3, verse 22 and 23 says, The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Can I say, I'm, I am so thankful that his mercies are new every morning. Because I'm not here today because I got everything put together. I'm not here because I know all the answers. Most days I can barely keep my shoes tied. That's why I double knot them because I know they stay tied that way. I seem to fail more often than I succeed. Anybody feel me? But I'm here today because I know that his mercies are new every morning. I believe that he wants this morning to begin to stir in us. He probably already has to awaken our vision. My vision for what? Lunch? No. It's way bigger than that. But lunch does sound good, doesn't it? Listen, I want to I share some kind of interesting statistics with you about our eyes. Is that, is that okay? If it's not okay, I'm going to do it anyways. Your eyes start to develop two weeks after you're conceived. Two weeks. And I... It's composed of more than 2 million working parts. I did not know this, any of these, until I looked them up. 80% of our memories are determined by what we see. Kind of scary, isn't it? A fingerprint, you know, they say your fingerprint is unique, designed just for you, and it is. But this statistic says, amen, Lord. But an iris, your iris has 256 unique characteristics, which is a reason for a retina scanning becoming increasingly more popular. 80% of what we learn, guess what, through our eyes. 80% of our memories and 80% of what we learn through our eyes. Your eyes are the second most complex organ after your brain. Here's some fun ones. It's, oh, wait, wait, wait. your eyes focus on 50 different things every second. Second, sorry. That's amazing, like, I'm trying to get other 50 things I can focus on, but our eyes, 50 different things. Here's the fun ones. Um, it's impossible to sneeze with your eyes open. How many of you have tried? Anybody? Okay, yes, thank you, thank you. I've tried, it, does, it, it doesn't work. I was always told you have to close your eyes, your eyes will pop out, That's what, but I don't think it's true. Here you go. The average person blinks 12 times a minute. How many of you just blinks? Yes, most of us, right? Oh, man, I did it. Listen, Today we're talking about vision, and I'm not really talking about our physical vision. I'm not really talking about our eyesight, but I'm talking about um, the vision that God has for every one of us as individuals. See, some of us are so focused on the future, we have no idea what's going on around us. Some of us are only able to talk about the way it used to be. Well, back in the good old days, well, back when I did this, and which I understand we have to have the past. We have to have a history to know how to progress and to move forward. It's history. Now we have to go forward and we can't just focus on the past. If all we do is focus on the past, guess what? We never go forward. In fact, I heard it said this way, growth stops when you talk about where you've been more than where you're going. Some of us are just, we're so accustomed to going through life on a daily basis that we've kind of forgotten the vision that God's given us for our life. You understand, God didn't create us just to go through life. He created us with a purpose. And he's given every one of us a vision. Some of you, if I ask you, hey, what's the, what's, what's the vision that God gave you for your life? Well, I don't even know. Well, well, at one time, I thought it was this, but, you know, I've just kind of gone through the motions of life. I just kind of have gotten sidetracked. We all do that. But 
it's not a good thing. I believe that today God is wanting to revive and, and to bring back the vision he's given us for our lives. In 2 Kings chapter 6, we read a story about Elisha, and he's being chased by the king of Aram. And at one point, he gets to a place, and, and the king of Aram finds out where Elisha is at, and he sends his troops. In fact, let's read it. Um, 2 Kings 6, verse 13 through 18, it says this, Go find out where he is, the king commanded, so I can send troops to seize him. And the report came back, Elisha is at Dothan. So one night the king of Aram sent a great army with many chariots and horses to surround the city. When the, servant of the God, uh, when the servant of the man of God got up early the next morning and went outside, there were troops, horses, and chariots everywhere. Oh, sir, what will we do now? The young man cried to Elisha. I can just see it in his voice like he's just like, like he's seeing a ghost. What are we going to do? Like we're going to die. And it's funny because I think a lot of times some of us come to the pastor and say, Pastor, I'm just, sir, I don't know what to do. And he's very wise, and he says, just, just relax. Pastor, Pastor, the, the church is full. What are we going to do? Just relax. God's got a plan. Watch. We're going to pray about it, and we're going to see what God does. And Elisha says, don't be afraid, for there are more on our side than on theirs. Then Elisha prayed, O Lord, open his eyes and let him see. The Lord opened the young man's eyes, and when he looked up, he saw the hillside around Elisha was filled with horses and chariots of fire. A lot of times, we get so focused on everything going on around us. We get so focused on life. We get so focused on our family that the vision that God has given us becomes a blind spot to us. And we don't see that vision. We don't see what he has for us. We get so overwhelmed with everything else. Sometimes we need to just stop and say, Lord, open my eyes so that I can see the vision you gave me and I can chase after what you want me to go. See, Elisha knew his purpose. Elisha knew the power of God. Elisha had no doubt what God was going to do. I, I look at Elisha, and I think of Elisha in this scenario where he gets up, and he goes, oh, yeah, there's a bunch of people out there. And this, this young servant is just, like, perplexed, like, why are you not freaking out? Like, do you understand? And Elisha goes, oh, I understand. But I love that Elisha says there are more on our side than there are that are around us. Elisha understood the vision and the, and the plan God had for his life, and he wasn't worried about what came across his path. See, some of us have allowed the enemies of our lives to steal the vision God has for us. Well, what enemy? I, I'm not mad at anybody, no, but finances, sometimes work, children, family. We allow things to come on our path. We allow things. Notice I don't say that they just like get there. We allow them to come in and we focus on everything else instead of focusing on what God has given us to view. Maybe, maybe all of us or some of us today need to pray and say, God, open my eyes so that I can see and be reminded of the vision you gave me. Proverbs 29, 18, the King James Version says, where there is no vision, the people perish. But he that keepeth the law, happy is he. I also like what the New Living Translation says. It says, when people do not accept divine guidance, they run wild. But whoever obeys the law is joyful. And one more version, the New International Version. I liked all three of these. It says, where there is no revelation, people cast off restraint, but blessed is the one who heeds wisdom's instructions. It's time for God to awaken the vision he has for every one of us. For some of you, you've never had a vision for your life. You don't know what the future, you don't know where God wants you to go. And this morning, it's time for God to give you that vision. For a lot of us, God's given us a vision and we've put it to the past because, well, I've done this, well, I've done that, and it's all about you. But God says, it's not about you, it's about me, and I want you to come back to a place where I can revive the vision I've given you so you'll chase after me and not after yourself. So there's a guy in the Bible that um, we talk a lot about sometimes in church. His name is Samson. Anybody read the story of Samson? I like the story of Samson, but Samson, there is times he's just an idiot. What you, like, what? like, Samson, come on, man. But see, Samson, there, God gave a vision and had a vision for Samson's life before he was ever born. And we read this story, and there's a, an angel of the Lord appeared to Samson's mom and his dad. In fact, here's what he said to, to Samson's mom. Judges 13, verse 5 says, You will become pregnant and give birth to a son, and his hair must never be cut, for he will be dedicated to God as a Nazarite from birth. He will begin to rescue, rescue Israel from the Philistines. That's a pretty big vision, isn't it? You'll begin, he'll begin to rescue Israel. He'll begin to rescue a nation from those that have captured them. He'll begin, but my mind kind of wonders, 
because God knew the dumb choices that Samson was going to make, is that why he only said he'll begin to rescue? Like, why is it, why is it he's only going to begin? Why did God not say, your son is going to rescue Israel, but he's just going to begin? And I wonder if it's because God knew that Samson was going to make some bad choices. Judges 13, 24, and 25 says this, When her son was born, she named him Samson, and the Lord blessed him as he grew up. The Spirit of the Lord began to stir him while he lived in Mahana Dan. I live in Crum, so sorry. Which is located between the towns of Zora and Eshtel. Some of us in this room, from the day we're born, God has blessed us and given us favor. Some of us, from the time we met him, he's blessed us and given us favor. Really, my heart kind of goes back, my kind of goes back to every one of us when we were born. God has blessed us and given us favor. It's whether or not we've chosen to walk in it or not. You see, his, I believe in his spirit this morning is beginning to stir in most, if not all of us, that I'm ready to take you and to challenge you with new things. The same old everyday mundane things are getting boring, but he says, because you're focusing on the everyday things, focus on me, and I'm taking you to a new place, but you've got to follow me. You have to be willing to let go of some things and to move forward. Some of us, I believe that God is going to present new opportunities that we don't, it doesn't make sense. Like, God, I can't do that. He goes, you're right. You can't, but I can. Well, but God, you... I can't go here because do you know what all I've done? He goes, yeah, it's no surprise. When you were born, I knew the mistakes you were going to make. I knew exactly where you were going to go. It's not a surprise to me. I knew everything, and yet I still have a vision and a purpose for your life to take you to places you can't go by yourself. Despite, Despite your flaws, your insecurities, your failures, he wants to take us to places we've never been, take us to places we can never go on our own. So I think there are three lessons we can learn from Samson about vision. And if you know the end of the story, it's no no pun intended that he loses his vision. But there are three things we can learn from Samson about the vision God has for us. Number one is you have to receive that vision firsthand. When you read the story of Samson, where did his vision come from? God sent an angel to his mom and his dad. When you read this story, I don't read anywhere where it says God sent an angel to Samson or God spoke to Samson. Samson heard the vision for his life, the plan for his life from his mom and dad. Judges 13, 5, you will become pregnant and give birth to a son. His hair must never be cut for he will de- be dedicated to God as a Nazarite from birth. He will begin to rescue Israel. Samson was living on borrowed words. Samson's vision for his life wasn't given direct. It was borrowed words from his parents that God spoke to his parents. Now listen, those are legitimate, valid words. When God speaks, it's a valid word. But Samson didn't hear directly from God. Well, Samson could have adhered to what God spoke and chosen to live the way God said to live, but he chose not to. Sounds familiar to some of us, doesn't it? We know what God says, we know what God has spoken, yet we still choose to do things our own way because, well, yeah, God, that sounds good, but this is a lot easier. This, is, this is, makes me feel good. This makes me feel better. Nowhere in the Bible does God say, if it makes you feel good, I want you to do, to do this. If it makes you feel comfortable, live for me. Can I tell you, living for God is uncomfortable, it's, it's scary, it's hard, and it's inconvenient. Samson made bad choices. But he's living off borrowed words. I wonder how many of us in this room are living off hearsay, borrowed words from someone else, instead of listening and hearing the vision that God has specifically for us. So many times we want to listen to everybody else instead of going to God. Well, they said this. Well, I don't care what they said. What did the Bible say? Well, so-and-so said this. I don't care. What did the Bible say? If what they did, what they said doesn't line up with the Bible, forget what they said. Well, pastor said this, and you know what? If what he said lines up with the word of God, listen. Well, well, this other pastor, well, I can't speak for them. But if it doesn't line up with what God has spoken to you, don't listen. Can I just give you a, a, a word of warning? Be very careful when someone comes up to you and says, I've been praying and the Lord spoke to me and I have a word for you. Okay, thank you. Be very cautious because you don't know what have they really been praying. They've been praying for you or about you. Those are two different things. 
but I know that God will speak to me. He, I don't have to rely on someone else to give me the vision God has for me. God will speak very clearly to me. Now, how I do know is that sometimes God will speak to someone else and confirm what he said to me. Two different things. When God speaks to me and he confirms it with somebody else, there's nothing wrong with that. But when he doesn't speak to me and speaks to someone else, I have to question, is this from God or is this from man? See, when we rely solely on others to tell us what God wants for our lives, we miss out on a lot. The most important thing is we miss out on a relationship with our creator, our savior, our king, and our best friend. So you have to know the vision for yourself. You have to know the vision for your family. No one else can tell you that. You have to know and you have to be grounded. That's what God said. If we don't teach our children how to listen to God's voice at a young age, they'll never learn. Some of you in this room, when you were young, your parents didn't teach you how to listen to the voice of God. And throughout time, you have had to try to learn, and you have done that. You have succeeded in hearing the voice of God. Can I tell you, it's much easier when we as parents take on the responsibility God has given us to teach our children what it means to follow God, to honor God, and to listen to his voice over anyone else's voice. See, while our children are young, they live, they live under, under our vision. Our girls live under our vision because they're our children. As they grow up, they will have a point where they have to say, God, what is your vision for my life? They will have to listen and hear God speak to them as well. What I know is it's the same thing as what I've heard for years, like being on staff at a church. If, if your heart and your vision doesn't line up with, this, with the pastor's vision for the church, then you might need to pray about it or leave. Because my children's vision, when they pray and then when God begins to speak to them, can I tell you something? Your children at five, six, seven, eight years old can hear from God and they can hear a vision from God at that young age. He's not a respecter of ages or persons. But their vision will line up with my vision and it will work together to, to, to grow the kingdom. Does it make sense? Now, I also believe that God expects us as, as, as parents to speak life into our children. So when they have a vision, we have to know with wisdom and with, with prayer what to speak so we speak life into the vision God's given them. So many times we want the, our kids to just listen to what I say. Well, but mom and dad, I've been praying about this. Well, I don't care what you've been praying about. Listen to what I, I'm your mom, I'm your dad, listen to me. Listen, that's scary to make a prayer, make a moment when I say, God, Speak to my children, and if what you speak to them isn't what I want, soften my heart so that I will listen to you and encourage them and speak life into the vision you give to them because it may not line up with what I want. Your son or daughter may, you be like, well, God, I want my children to be successful. I want them to be just, you know, whatever. Success isn't all about money. Success is honoring God with your life. We'll just, we'll, we'll go. See, when we hear directly from God, his plan and his vision for our life, it makes a much bigger impact on me, and I'm willing to fight for it and protect it no matter what it costs. When I hear God speak, I will fight to honor what he speaks. I will fight to make sure I hold tight to what he says. Number two is this, protect the vision. When God speaks and gives the vision, I have to know it, I have to hear it myself. But number two, I have to protect it. Samson toyed with the vision that God gave him. You read this story and Samson did all these crazy things. He, he was told not to do this and he did it anyways. He gave uh, riddles, he gave all these tests. At the end of Judges, at the end of the story, you hear Samson is, um, Mary is Delilah. And you hear, and the hell is hard to talk over. You hear that Samson, as he's married to the lie, she says, well, well, Samson, if you love me, if you love me, you'll, you'll tell me your strength. If you love me, and she begins to toy with him, and he begins to play this game with her back and forth. When God gives you a vision, don't toy with it, don't play with it, hold on to the vision and protect it. Samson didn't protect it. Samson toyed with what God gave him. Samson kind of played back and forth, and guess what happened? Verse 20, then she cried out, Samson, the Philistines have come to capture you. When he woke up, he thought, I'll do as before, I shake myself free. Probably one of the saddest scriptures in, in the Bible. But he didn't realize the Lord had left him. You see, when we toy with the vision that God's given us, when we toy with the plan that God has for our life, there'll become a moment when we don't realize that the Lord has left us and we're on our own. Because we chose to neglect what he said. 
when it's not my vision that was given directly to me, I don't want it or I don't and I won't take ownership of it and I won't fight for it. My curiosity kind of gets the best of me sometimes and I wonder what if, what if God had just blessed Samson's parents with Samson and after Samson was born, if God had visited Samson and said, Samson, you're to be dedicated to me. You're to be what I've asked you to be and you're going to rescue Israel. What would Samson's life have looked like? I don't know. Maybe you're asking, well, how do I protect the vision? Let me give you four quick things. Number one, you have to make pre-decision decisions. What? I got to know what I'm going to do when I get there before I ever get there. What are, what are you talking about? Am I going to have integrity with every decision or am I going to just kind of let it slide past? I have to know, am I going to honor God in every scenario and every situation in my life with my finances, with my attendance, with my family? Am I going to honor God? If I am, then that tells me what I got to say no to now. So when I get to a point where somebody says, hey, what about this? I got to say, no, I'm sorry. The vision God's given me for my life, I'm going to protect it. I'm going to say no to that so I can say yes to him. So many times we say yes to good things and we say no to great because we want to be pleasing to everyone else, be pleasing to God and everything else to take care of itself. Number two, you have to set safeguards and boundaries and do not cross them. Well, I'm an adult. I don't need safeguards. Yes, you do. You are not. Yeah, yes, you do. Number three, do life with people who keep you accountable, speak life in your vision, and will push you towards God, not away. We make excuses about hanging and being around people who have nothing, no desire to be in church or around God. Well, well I'm witnessing to them. Doesn't look like it. Looks like they're witnessing to you. But be careful. Do life with people that surround yourself with people that are going to push you to God, not pull you from God. Well, how do I tell? Look, if the things that they're doing don't honor God, then be careful. Now, I'm not saying don't be around people who aren't Christian because that's what we're supposed to do is be around, be um, in the world, not of the world. We've got to be around people that don't know Jesus so we can take them to Jesus. So understand. Number four, keep your eyes focused ahead of you on Jesus. A rearview mirror in your car is not there to focus on. If you focus on the rearview mirror in the past, you're going to have a wreck. It's in the back. It's behind you. It's in the rear. You learn, you grow, you move on. Proverbs 24 or 4.25 says this, look straight ahead, fix your eyes on what lies before you. Fix your eyes. That means not by chance, but on purpose, look forward. Fix your eyes on the, on the front of you. See, when you lose your vision, everything becomes a grind. The daily life becomes a grind. Going to work becomes a grind. Judges 16.21 says, so the Philistines captured him, gouged out his eyes, they took him to Gaza where he bound, was bound with bronze chains and forced to grind grain in the prison. Samson lost his vision, not only physically, but you see spiritually, emotionally, or everything else as well. The daily grind. Some of us have lost the vision that God give, has given us. We've either lost it or we've walked away from it, and now we dread every single day. It's a grind just to make it through. I'm hoping I can make it through today. I'm hoping I can make it. We don't even worry about Friday. Like, can I get through today? Can I get through noon? Can I get through 10 o'clock? If I can do that, I can go to noon. If I can get through that, I can go to 2 because when we lose that vision that God's given us, we kind of lose our desire to, to grow and to live. Check this out. I heard it said this. Um, Pastor and author Mark Batterson says this. I'm not convinced that your date of death is a date carved on your tombstone. Most people die long before that. We start dying when we have nothing worth living for, and we don't really start living until we find something worth dying for. Can I tell you that when God gives you a vision, you've got something worth dying for? Because it's a vision to see people come to Jesus. Well, mine doesn't look like yours. You're right. Every single one of us are called to make disciples. Every single one of us are called to lead people to Jesus. No matter where you work, no matter where you don't work, no matter where you go, our calling as every one of us individuals is to take people to Jesus. Our path is different. Some of, I work at a church and drive a bus. That's my path. You work somewhere else. That's your path. But it doesn't mean that our visions don't end the same place. They do. They take people to Jesus, what we're supposed to do. Third point, third lesson from Samson is this. Hair grows back. Maybe not all of us, but you know what I'm saying. <laughs> Judges 16, 22, it says, but before long, his hair began to grow back. Why is that so significant? If you don't know the story of Samson, God made this vision with his, his mom, and his strength was in his hair. When his hair was cut, he lost his strength. As his hair grows back, guess what happens? 
he begins to get strong again. Well, what's the point of that? Don't give up. Don't quit. Don't quit. You may have strayed from the vision that God gave you. You may have gone a totally different way. You may have made mistakes. You may have, have had hiccups in your life. Can I tell you something? God still gave you a vision. The path to get to that vision may look a little different than it originally did, but that vision is still there. It's, you guys have a water bottle? You have a water bottle? A coffee cup? Anything? Somebody? Right here. Oh, thank you, Pastor. The water bottle. What does the water bottle do? I open it and I drink it. It nourishes my, my thirst. It quenches my thirst. Is that still a water bottle? But I'm not holding it. Can that water bottle still quench my thirst? Yes. But it's not in my hands. I may walk away from what God has given me, but can I tell you something? When I walk back, it's still there. It's still there. And when I begin to open that bottle and take a drink, guess what happens? It begins to nourish my body again. It begins to quench my thirst. When I walk back to the vision that God has given me, guess what? The hair grows back, and it begins to take me to a new place. It begins to take me to a new level. Even though I made mistakes, guess what? He takes me from those mistakes and says, you learn from them, now use them to teach others and go towards me. So I'm here to tell you, just because you strayed away doesn't mean your vision is dead. I know a God, and I serve a God that brings what is thought to be dead back to life. In the book of Mark chapter 5, you read where Jesus gets out of the boat, and, and the leader of the synagogue comes to him, Jairus, and says, Master, my daughter is sick and she's dying. Will you come heal her? And he begins to go with Jairus to, to his house, and he gets stopped, and he talks to the woman who had the issue of blood. And people come to Jairus and say, Jairus, hey, man, don't bother the master. Don't bother him. Your daughter is dead. What does Jesus say? He looks at Jairus. He goes, just have faith. As a dad, come on, Jesus, my daughter's dead. Just have faith. Give me something more than that. He said, just have faith. You know what Jairus did? Okay. Like, I'd be going crazy. He goes, okay. And he stays with Jesus. There's something in that. When you stay with Jesus, it's easier to have a little faith, isn't it? In Mark 5, 39, Jesus and Jairus get to Jairus' house. It says this, Jesus went inside and asked, why all this commotion and weeping? The child isn't dead. She's only asleep. The crowd laughed at him. Can I tell you something? You may think your vision is dead and the crowd may laugh at you, but when Jesus speaks, when God speaks, you can take his words to the bank and know that it's truth. And know that when he says, your vision is not dead, it's only sleeping. Your vision is not dead, I have a plan. Your vision is not gone, we're going back to it. You can know that when he speaks, it's a guarantee. He will do what he says he'll do. The crowd laughed, but he made them all leave. He took the girl's father and mother and his three disciples in the room where the girl was lying. Holding her hand, he said to her, Talitha Kaum, which means little girl, get up. And the girl who was 12 years old immediately stood up and walked around. They were overwhelmed and totally amazed. Can I tell you, when you go back to a place where you get alone with God and say, God, you've given me a vision, you've given me a purpose and a plan, I walked away, I want to get back to that vision. Some of you are saying, God, I want a vision for myself. I want a vision for my family. I want a vision. And he's going to speak life, and people around you will be amazed, not because of who you are and what you've done, but because of what God does through you. It's safe. Well, let me go back. Philippians 3.14 says, I press on to reach the end race and receive the heavenly prize for which God, through Christ Jesus, is calling us. 2 Timothy 4.8 says, Now the prize awaits me, the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on the day of his return. And the prize is not just for me, but for all who eagerly look forward to his appearing. You see, we get so focused sometimes on the past and what's going on around us, we forget to fix our eyes what's on, on what's in front of us. We forget to fix our eyes on Jesus and push forward. The prize doesn't come when I get tired. The prize doesn't come when I quit. The prize comes at the end of the race. It's safe to say that Samson fulfilled the vision God had for his life. He started to deliver Israel. But I'm still curious. What if Samson had made the right choices and had adhered to the word of God? What if Samson had listened to the directions God gave him? Could he have been the one that delivered Israel at that time instead of just the initiator? of the deliverance. 
See, here's, here's my thought, is the church doesn't thrive when we come in and sit down in the seat. That's not a thriving church. A thriving church is when you and I come together as a body of Christ, as one church, and we have a vision that God has given us, and we allow our vision to work together with the vision of the church to go out and to reach people who need to know Jesus and to come into a relationship with him. That's when the church thrives. Let's pray this morning. Lord, thank you for today. God, thank you for your goodness, and thank you for the vision you've given every one of us. Some of us today, God, we have set it down, we've walked away from it, and we've become so overwhelmed. We're bitter, we're angry, we're frustrated with you, with ourselves, with everyone around us, because we've allowed that vision to just become there. We've not grabbed a hold of it. We've not held on to it. We've not put it into practice. And so Lord, I pray that today, God, that above everything else, we would hear your voice, that you're saying the vision still lives. I am the God of the living. I bring things back to life that were thought to be dead. For some of us today, God, you're simply saying, I have a vision. I want to give you the vision for your life if you'll allow me to speak into your life. So Lord, I pray that we'd hear you today and that we'd accept your word. God, following and chasing the vision you give for us, it's not easy. Most of the time it's inconvenient and it's challenging and it's hard because I have to put my will and my, my desires to the side so that I can be obedient to your will and to your way. Sometimes it means I have to delete apps on my phone. Sometimes I have to, I have to get rid of some things in my life so that I can add you where you're supposed to be. Sometimes it means I have to forgive people that have wronged me and that have hurt me. Sometimes it means that I have to just be Jesus with skin on even when I don't want to. But God, today remind us you are the God that brings things back to life. The visions we've walked away from, the visions we've set down, you still breathe life into those things. You still have a plan and a purpose. Even though it may not make sense, we may not understand how, when we trust you, you breathe life into things that were once thought to be dead. So speak very clearly to us today to hear your voice. Church, can I ask you this morning with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, maybe you're here and say, Pastor Jason, um, I don't even know Jesus, so I don't have a, a vision. I don't have an understanding of what he wants for my life because I don't even know him. But there's something today inside of me that says I need to know this person you call your savior, your king, your best friend. I need a relationship one-on-one -on -one with this Jesus you talk about. If that's you, can I ask you real quick just to raise your hand and put it back down. Nobody's looking around. It's me, you, and Jesus. That's it. He's the most important. Cool. Thank you. Anybody else? We're gonna, I'm going to stop right here, and before we go anywhere else, I want to, I want to ask you to do me a favor. My prayer doesn't change your life. My prayer doesn't make any difference. But when you pray and you ask God to be the Savior, the Lord, and the ruler of your life for a personal relationship, your words and your heart create change. So church, can I ask you, there, there are some that raised their hand this morning. Can I ask you to pray and repeat this prayer after me? because this is an important moment. It's just huge. The Bible says that when one person comes to the Lord, the angels throw a party. Can I ask you to repeat this prayer after me? If you raise your hand, I definitely want to ask you to repeat this prayer because I want you to know Jesus like I know Jesus. And today he wants to know you as well. Let's say that Jesus, today, I ask you to come into my life, be my Lord, my Savior, my best friend. Forgive me for everything I've done that you call sin. Make me right in your eyes. Today, Jesus, I accept you. I give you my life. Use me. Change me the way you want me to be. Teach me to live like you. Thank you for your friendship. Thank you for your salvation, and thank you for your healing. In Jesus' name.
Amen. Thank you for watching and worshiping with us today. Make sure you subscribe to this channel so you don't miss a video or a live stream. And please share this video with your friends and family. If this message has encouraged you today, please let us know in the comments as we would love to connect with you. And thank you so much for your generosity. Because of you and your faithful giving, together we share the gospel around the world. So please visit our website, crumbcc.church, and use the giving link. God bless you. We can't wait to worship with you again next week.